What we have today is five interview questions for remote scrum master job opportunities. So we try to come up with something creative, like with the world as it is with COVID all over the planet, you know, there's a lot more remote opportunities, a lot of teams scattered across the, the world. And um, so when digging five questions, feel free to ask questions, text some questions. Maybe someone can say, hey, Greg, I got a question. And let me know, and we can we can stop and talk as we go. I'm going to ask for some interaction also. So I want to thank you all for letting me attend your Lean Coffee session here. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. So any questions? All right. So let's go to the next one. Okay. So I did a quick look into the LinkedIn remote job um, market for remote Scrum Masters. And I like to do this just for any time I do one of these sessions, talk about anything really agile. I like to tell everyone, share with what I see in the job market. It's always good to know. Um, so what I looked in, I looked in Nigeria, United States, and EU. Because the idea, if you were going to do remote, you can do remote Scrum Master for US or EU. I picked EU because it would be in the same quasi time zone so that the opportunities are there so you can think about remote um and i'll give everyone i'll supply this presentation in pdf and post it i'll post it up on my uh website and also my show the 5 a.m master scrum show so i have a, a url that says 5 a.m master scrum i'll post this as a pdf too so if anybody wants it and if there's a cattail that comes on you can join the cattail i don't know if you can see it there's a little cattail there's a whole TikTok thing of cattails on presentations. So there's one right there. Um, but here you can see like a Scrum Master job in Nigeria is like 29. Remote, there's two. Right. Looking at the United States, there's 71,000 Scrum Master jobs scattered across the United States. And that's a pretty big market. Um, even compared to the EU, we got 71 versus 20,000, right? remote job but there's 12,000 remote jobs so maybe the opportunity is there to do that remote in EU there's 1800 scrum master remote type positions out there that so maybe you say hey there's no jobs for me here but maybe you can do remote right so this is why we're asking that question one other thing I want to show is always interesting um, when you do look for a scrum master job a lot of companies don't have a quote scrum master position in their HR um, list. So they call it a agile project manager or maybe even project manager. So look for that term also. Don't hesitate to apply for the agile project managers. If you're a scrum master, you probably could do the agile project manager role too. So in Nigeria, there's 20 of those, one remote in the United States, there's 21,000 agile project managers. And you can see there's a big difference between that and Scrum Master for the United States. The same in the EU, there's like 11,000. And then if you do the remote, there's like 3,000 remote and 734 remote. So that just increases the number of opportunities for you to work as a Scrum Master. Um, and no matter what you learn in this Agile discussion and Agile in general, Scrum Master, Product Owner, just Agile general stuff, look at all the new jobs now that have the word Agile in, in their jobs in LinkedIn. In the United States alone, 344,000 jobs reference Agile somewhere in their job description. In the EU, 147,000 jobs. So never think that, hey, I, I got this cert or I learned a little bit of Agile won't help you maybe if you become a developer or business analyst or a coder or a tester or anything like that having that agile experience could apply to those jobs and give you a better position so i just wanted to share that with you all today because sometimes people don't look at it i'm in linkedin all the time that's every i'm a i'm a consultant so about every six months or every year i'm out looking for a new job so i'm always in linkedin and as I said before, I have almost 12,000 connections now in LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me. And what that will do, I'll give you one last job uh, reference. If you get a headhunter who, who's a job placement thing, wants to connect with you, go ahead and connect with them. Because by connecting with them in LinkedIn, it develops a network, right? 
and now you're connected to their connections via LinkedIn. So your name will pop up for maybe the corporate company they're actually working for if they're connected. So it expands your realm. So connect with me. That'll give you a second level connection to all my connections. And maybe there's businesses in the head or is looking for me. Oh, I'm looking for Scrum Master. Oh, I know this person knows Greg. I'll, you know, I'll check in with them, right? So f please feel to do that. Any questions? Did you like this data? You guys are all mute. Absolutely. Lovely data. Okay. I know there's some business analysts on there, so they always love this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, all right. So here I'm going to do five questions. So I want to get into it, make sure we get in time. Um, so I'm going to give you five questions, and I have two bonus questions at the end, okay, if we get there. Um, we're going to talk burn down charts, daily scrum, talk a little bit of retro, um, meetings where there's no agendas, what do you do? And then uh, missing team norms, definition ready, definition done. Um, and we'll go from there. And then the last one, I have one about scrum events and workflow. So these are all remote type job questions that you might get related to Scrum Master. And I know we just said someone just passed their PSM. Okay. So Where I'm like, you, you might want to mute somebody. So I don't know if you can mute the one that's talking to Lopi. Data. Um, but anyway, so the, whoever got their PSM, maybe we'll use you and you can help answer these questions, okay? If you're up for it. All right. So I need someone to volunteer. So here's question one. I got a couple burn down charts. And then who wants to volunteer with me what, what they see when they see this chart here? Anybody want to give me an idea what they're seeing in this chart? Besides, I am a terrible drawler. Come on, where's my PSMs? Scrum Masters, you have to talk up or you're not going to get the job. <laughs> All right, let me go for it. Okay. What do, you see, what do you see when you see this? Uh, which of them? All of them? Or All right, we'll start, with, yeah, we'll start with this one first, and then we'll work our way around. Go for it, oh. Joe. Uh, I, I can't see your uh, mouse on any of them. Oh, okay. So, Start on the know. left. Start on the left side. Um, I guess I can label it. Well, uh, can you see it now, so, like this yeah, one? Yeah, yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay. Um, I would say everything pretty much was going smooth to the last minute. Okay. That everything just you know ends appropriately. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anybody else want to add anything on this one? Yeah, what I feel is that the team sat on their backlog for quite a long time. Okay. And towards the end of the sprint, they held us filtered to get that completed. And by the end of the two week sprint, they were able to meet, but everything was done at the end. Burn down was not uh, proper. Okay. Okay. Anybody else want to add anything? Or do you want to go to the next one? And they're all good answers, by the way. Okay, let's go to this one on the bottom where you see the, the burn down chart. Now, a burn down chart is the track of how much work gets done during a sprint um, as they go move along. This one, they started up high and they came crashing down within the first couple of days. Then they kind of worked their way and then and then came to the end. Yeah. Any, any things? Uh, that could be any uh, blockers during the... Uh... Uh, sprint two week sprint that is uh, they are not able to complete the uh, the, the user stories after okay. after a period of time. Okay. Good. Anybody else? They may not have done a uh, good job at breaking down the content and understanding the content in the beginning of the sprint, given their lag at the end. Okay. Good. Anybody else? This is actually one of my favorite ones. And I'll, I'll go over that in a little bit. Okay, let's go to this top right one where you see it's kind of going along and then it bumps up and then comes down and then it looks like it's working down and it kind of stops up here at the end of the time box. 
what, what does this one say? Um, by the end of the sprint, uh, they weren't able to complete all their mm -hmm. tasks. Yep. Um, and some more tasks got added, maybe, as they were going. Okay. Good observations. Anybody else? Um, for me, for me, I feel um, maybe the the development team had some issues. Okay. Uh, with um, the the scope of the pro of of the product, and then um, um, of course, uh, at the end of the day, they couldn't finish. Okay. Good. Uh, for for me, I, I would think uh, the, the the product owner really hasn't really done a good job in really trying to uh, identify the. Uh, the scope communicates effectively the scope of the project to the team. So, okay. and I think there was a lack of uh, mutual understanding. Okay, good. Those are all awesome descriptions too. Um, okay, what about this last one? It's a pretty good burn down chart kind of stayed, but then it kind of hung around. They look like they're working together. So is this like a good one? Any thoughts? Does it look, it looks pretty good to me. Any any concerns or anything or any thoughts related well, to this? I'll say it's the best of the pop. It's the best of the bunch? Okay. Yeah. By the way, this one's a trick question. <laughs> so this one's a trick question. It's a challenging. This good this is this difference between a entry level scrum master and an advanced scrum master, by the way. This is what this is going to quiz you on. So now on the next slide, I'll show you some of the points that I have. Um, all right. So here's some things I came up with. We can talk about them a little because this is an interactive thing. We are on the Zoom call, so feel free. Um, in this one, stories are too big, right? They're not small enough to get done on a, on a regular basis. What about the product owners not available to approve the stories, right? Maybe the product owner, I'll see you in a, two weeks. I got to do my other job. They're not around to approve the stories as the team works them. Okay. So anybody expecting this one? Is that is that kind of surprising? Have you seen it before? Uh, to me, it, it looks kind of surprising to me. <laughs> I, I never would have envisioned such kind of situation. There you go. <laughs> that That happens all the time. They're off doing their business stuff. They don't have time for the dev team or the team, whatever. And they're out there. I've had it where VPs were POs. And I go, we don't want a vice president as a PO. No, <laughs> they're never available. Um, so these are kind of things you got to think out of the box. Greg, yes. for go the ahead. first one, is it yes. also possible that the developers um, were not updating their tickets? And then at the last minute, they yes. then went into June? tickets that that could be one of the problems yep 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 but i but everyone says do they not update that, um, the the testers were not waiting on the developers so they just wrote the testing towards the end of the sprint it could be yeah or uh can it be that um, they take more stories to work on and they have more uh in the work in progress uh, itself and the and later on, they rush up to complete all the stories that's been picked up. It could be, yeah. If even if they took too many stories on, it would it could theoretically, if they were they were healthy, it would still burn down. They just wouldn't get them all done. They would stop like here, like if it was that. But in this case, maybe just just a couple. I just wanted to give you a couple things outside of the norms of hey, they're not updating tickets or. You know, just things aren't getting done or not working. Maybe there's something more in depth that the scrum master has to find out and investigate, right? Your job as a scrum master is to facilitate the organization. How about this one down the bottom? This is my one of my favorites. The sprint might be too short, right? Maybe it maybe it's too short of a time to get it done. Lots of partial work done from the previous sprint where they they didn't finish it but they had a lot of work in progress and they took the la the first two days of the sprint to close out the work that is something you can do a retrospective on right um and then the team worked the easy stuff first so maybe they had a bunch of easy stories that they call them cherry picking 
that they did in the beginning of the sprint. And then they go, oh, oh here's some, we got some medium ones. And then we get the, the hardest ones last, right? So maybe there's a couple that take long. So it's just, just some thoughts. These are all things that you can, that I'm giving you that you can hold a retrospect of relating to. So when you see this shape, what do you do with it? Then your retrospect, and then that can go into more detail interview question, right? Here's another one. Um, stories. Go ahead. The one that you just talked about, I, I see that a lot. Is there something we can do that would circumvent that? One, where there was a comment earlier about taking on too much work. Maybe the sprints are taking on too much work. So cut down on your sprint backlog so that there there's more time, more, more concentration on smaller number of issues so that they can get it done in the sprint before versus I need an extra two weeks or, or an extra couple days to finish it. Or they just didn't get something tested. There could be a couple different reasons. But I like to lower the the number of stories or issues or the points in a sprint to help solve this at least at first. Like it takes the pressure off, right? Um, here's one where we had the spike, right? Um, stories being added mid sprint. So maybe the scrum mat, uh, product owner or customers coming in the product owner. We need more stories. Oh yeah, we'll do whatever you want, right? Maybe it's poor sprint planning. Maybe they didn't plan very well where they didn't go through and analyze on part, I call it part two of sprint planning and look at the work that really need to be done. Um, Maybe the sprint, this is what I always challenge people, maybe the sprint is too long for the customer. When you pick your sprint time box, you should also get a feeling for what your customer's appetite is for change. Can they handle a long sprint? Can they not? Maybe they can't handle a whole month, right? So those are the kind of things you want to ask. Um, and not enough teamwork going on. Maybe just people just not working together. So that's just one. And then the last one, this is my trick question. This is where you really get it. This is really good. They're really burning down. And I put in here a three or four week sprint. When I get teams that can burn down in a four week sprint and they're burning down every day, I offer them, why don't we cut the sprint in half? Why don't we go from a four week sprint to a two week sprint? Why don't we go from a three week sprint to a two week sprint? Because they're burning stuff down. So if I cut it off here, they're getting their work done. So this this is the opportunity to shorten that time, which then makes the customer more happy, right? So that's something you can, you can do. Uh, anybody think about this as an opportunity to split the sprint in half? Have you ever done that? Where they had a four week sprint and then you moved them down to a two week sprint. Well, uh, would that really be very, would that be really be a good practice? Oh yeah, the shorter the sprint, the less stuff in your backlog. And I did a whole video on that in my five A master scrum. They can concentrate on the work they want to get done and deliver it. So the less things, distraction, less number of things the more focused, the more efficient a team's going to be. So if you look at a whole sprint, maybe had 40 issues, but they're getting a good burn down, like that's on that graph. If you cut it in half, now they're only worried about 20 issues. And if you have 10 people on your team, let's say I'm just picking number 10. That means each person during a two-week sprint only has to work on two issues. Wouldn't you love to have two issues to work on for an entire two weeks? I mean, your life would be like, this is awesome, right? Um, so that's why you do that, right? And it, But it's the same work. It's the same workload, but it breaks it down and makes their brain easier and they don't get overrun with, what do I do next? So, okay. I think it makes it like um, a better use of time as well, right? Yeah. Um, since Scrum is like really big on transparency and visibility, um, I just think it allows you to just like, um, hmm, just uh, just be a better use of time and, and things of that nature and be more transparent. Okay. Yeah, no, great. And again, this is like a uh, job interview question, right? If I showed you this burn down chart, 
so can what opportunities does this give you as a scrum master? Uh, the answer might be cut the sprint in half, right? So that would be a, the trick question, right? All right. So next question: daily scrum. So maybe some people we got two. It's a subpart. How long should a scrum master take to transition out of leading the daily scrum? Is question A. And question two is, how does a scrum master transition out of leading the daily scrum? So, any thoughts on how long should a, a scrum master be leading the daily scrum? Any any thoughts on how long should you do it forever? We got some PSMers here. Give me some PSM people that pass their test. That'd be great. Uh, I... I think I, I like to look at it from uh, uh, three phases. Okay. Uh, being, 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 being a scrum master, just looking at it from three uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the first one, you are on your, what you call a high touch. Like okay. uh, you, you just have a, you have a team, they are new to scrum. Uh -huh. So then you try to uh, guide them a lot, like, um, okay. like children. Okay. Then, uh, then uh, uh, after a while, you you try to step out. Uh, you try to step out a little bit, okay. and uh, just just try to uh, oversee them wherever they wherever they are going wrong, and, and just try to come in. Uh, then uh, in the last stage, like uh, no touch, so you allow them to do what they need to do. You know they are they are matured. Uh, uh, they are matured enough uh, to do that. So I, I think uh, it's going to be uh, how well the, uh, the Scrum Master is able to assess uh, that the team has uh, matured and okay. they themselves can take uh, the uh, initiatives uh, themselves. But I think the earlier, the, the shorter the Scrum Master mm -hmm. is able to do that, I think it's going to show how more effective it is in trying to bring the, uh, the the team together on Scrum adoption. Okay, cool. To add to that, to I would say for how long, on average, I would say probably for a new for a team that is finally just in like introducing Scrum, probably mm -hmm. about the first three months. Okay. So you yeah, it's been the first three months. Okay. And um, when one thing you notice, I made the Scrum Master picture bigger. Cause like you know how Zoom calls, whoever's talking gets the bigger picture on the Zoom call, and everyone else gets a smaller one. So I purposely did this where the Scrum Master is talking all the time during the daily Scrum, and then the developers or the development team are talking less. And then I want to give you this now. Now here's a question. Now, you know, might ask you how does the Scrum Master transition out of leading? And Maxwell kind of led to kind of. Uh, indicated that how he would handle transitioning out of leading the daily scrum. So that might be a follow-up question that you would get in your job interview. Now, here's what I kind of throw up this thing. The scrum master, as you can see, I had the dev team members are bigger because they're talking. The scrum master is just on the side, just facilitating. They're in the conversation, but they're not really in the conversation. Okay. Um, the, and I would say within the first month, you know, um, Brian, you said uh, maybe three months. For me, a daily scrum is within 30 days because I got 30 opportunities to get them to run daily scrum or be on their side. You can always introduce stuff, but how they would do it. But design it so everyone talks like from day one, use your scrum board because you're going to be in virtual environments. So maybe you're using Jira or Azure or version one or Rally, or whatever's out there, or Trillo. Um, use a scrum board that goes by person so that they know without you saying, hey, Greg, hey, Brian, you're next. Max will go next. Shelly, go, you know, and, and just Florence, you're, you know, it's your turn. You don't need to speak as a scrum master. If you use the alphabetic order that the board already creates, let them just talk. They know who's next. They all see the screen. You don't have to say a word. Um, those are those people swim lanes um, and get people to talk about their work. If you use the swim lanes, they know what their work is. They can't hide it. That's transparency. 
And so therefore they talk about it. It's not someone that represents them. So that's just something to think about for the first month and day one, set it up so it can do that. And then facilitate outside the daily scrum, but always be observant. This is one thing that I debate with people. People say, well, the scrum master is not supposed to be in a daily scrum and neither is a product owner, according to the scrum guide. This is where I think that's a misinterpret of the scrum guide, scrum guide, just like those three questions used to be. Why wouldn't you want the product owner at the daily scrum? Because if the team has a story they want the product owner to prove, why don't they ask the, scrum, the product owner, hey, I'll have this story later this afternoon for you to approve. Can you approve it and get that communication right there in that daily scrum? And the scrum master always wants to see who's talking and who's not. Because you're in the background, you're looking at the backlog, who's doing things not moving. If you don't hear about blockers, but you're seeing something on your electronic boards that are indicating a blocker, you need to get back to that person after Scrum and say, hey, how come you didn't mention this? Is there something we need or you need, you know, don't hesitate to bring that up or put it in chat if you need some help or something, you know, how can I help you? And then they should come around. But if they're not in that daily Scrum, they won't know that they need help. So I, the ones that say you don't have to be there at all, I'm like, I would, I would debate that. Your job is help facilitate the workflow. And if you don't know what the people are talking about, how do you do that, right? So it's just something to think about. Um, all right, next question, because I want to make sure that we get where we are on timing matter. So they might ask you to do a create a retro, Monica. Hello, yes. I absolutely agree with you um, on what points you just made. Okay. Consider. Um, team is supposed to be a self-managing team. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in 30 days, really, I feel that everyone within the team should be able to, I mean, um, coordinate the daily scroll yep. with the, of course, with the guidance and then supervision of the scroll master. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I, I feel that one of the great quality of the scroll master would be, you know, um, taking it around and making sure that everyone participate fully such that everyone, um, you know, build their confidence as leaders and are able to, you know, have this, um, this ability to know that, look, um, we are all potential scrum masters and we are all self-managing. And then of course, daily scrum yep. is one of the, that is mandatory um, within the scrum guide. So yeah, yeah. everyone will and you and you made a good point about everyone participating and just to reference that why I say talk to them outside if you call somebody out in the middle of the daily scrum you're gonna lower their their trust factor and their safety level so by talking to them by observing it noting it writing it down whatever and then later on coming back you maintain that trust bond that you're not calling out someone in the middle of a meeting, even a little scrum team. They, they, they don't like that. So, so by getting out of it, now you can do your facilitating and your coaching for the individuals. Does that sound okay with you, Monica? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay. I get it. Cool. cool. Perfect. Yeah, um, fine. I'm going to say, so I got, you know, create a retro. They may have a whiteboard on their session and things like that, but if they don't, buy yourself a little tiny whiteboard like this for your interviews. So if you wanted to draw something right away and they didn't have it, like I can draw, you know, I can do, and if you learn like me, you can do it this way. Good, the bad, uh, improve, this is my classic. And I go risks. And then I draw a little sailboat. Doo -doo. We all know the little sailboat. And then I have a little anchor. And I always draw this funky little octopus. Doo -doo -doo. He's slowing you down. Risks. Got these big mountains under the water. You know. Um, and there, I just showed him how I can do a retro. So can you imagine doing an interview and you just did a retro like this? 
on a little whiteboard real fast, set it up, and then I have people, you know, put some ideas in here and stuff like that. So have a little whiteboard on there handy because you're a scrum master. We all have these little highlighters and whiteboards. Sometimes having this helps out. And to say I would do it on Mural or or whatever whiteboard system you have. Maybe it's Microsoft. Maybe it's Mural. Maybe it's Mural. Stuff like that. So this is my little – when you get that, have one of these things. It's just so you can draw it real fast. Oh, okay. <laughs> you just did this in five seconds. I just built a retro board, right? And then you just say, then I have people fill these in um, virtually and put the stickies and and you just answer the question for them. Nobody does that, by the way. So if you did it, you would be ahead of everyone else in the game. All right, next slide. Here's something that you can take to elevate your game when you do the interview. When you see retros like this, and they say, what went well, what went bad, what improved, what improved. it's classic stuff. The problem is it's not getting you to the answer. This is where you take the system's take on it. So in this beginning, you start like, okay, let's, let's talk. So let's talk about all the problems. So all these things that people write on here is all this problem. We're diverging. Everyone's adding ideas. These are all the problems we want to do. Then what I like to do is I like to take a vote, okay? I have everyone vote. So let's say I had a bunch of stickies on here, you know, and I use a virtual system. I say, okay, of all these problems, let's get our top five or top two problems we want to work on, and I have people vote. Maybe there's a couple votes. Maybe there's a vote here. Maybe there's a three votes here maybe there's one for risk okay now based on the top vote let's work on that solution and that's so we voted to converge so we're converging on here on the on the presentation and then we diverge again on solutions what people don't do is they don't diverge on the solutions everyone in that room is going to have a different answer for the solution to those problems. So now you do another thing. Let's do a, a brainstorm around Robin. What are all the different things we can do to fix the problems? You could do a fishbone, you know, you can do all that kind of stuff and then identify the solutions and then do it again where you take a vote at the end and converge on what solution would you want to implement? And the key is which one do you want to implement in the next sprint? Okay. And then that whatever that one is that you vote for is the one the team works on and gets fixed in the next sprint. So now if you were to take one of those mural boards that are up there and they're really pretty and they're really fancy, problem is they never get you to the end where you converge on what you want to do. So make sure you do this diverging on the solutions and then converging on what you want to enter in your backlog. Okay. So you can draw the basic one, but then explain how you have everyone do this system's take to come up with one thing that they can improve on. I like to call it Kaizen. If you want to label things in Kaizen in your backlogs, that's how I do it and track it um, for a process improvement. Any questions on this board or these thought concepts? question is sure. it's, it's not on the concepts which are awesome and i agree with you about coming up with a solution otherwise mm -hmm. it, it could be a complaint session you said you use a virtual voting system do you have someone that you like or that's easiest to use um most of the mural boards have a voting on it okay. you just turn on the voting there's a voting okay. option all right it's part of mural okay Thanks. Any other questions? Any thoughts? But try um, this. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That's on. on the last, on the retrospective board that you built, what was the thing that was at the bottom? This left? one? It was. Uh, yeah. Right here? Um, no, not risk. The one. Oh, right what here. went bad? Oh, I drew an octopus? Is that what you want to know? Yeah. 
an yeah. anchor. <laughs> Yeah. It slows you down. There's like, why are we slowing down? It's because we're dragging this giant squid on the back of the boat. You know, there's something funny. Because what's what was funny? I did this one time with a bunch of coaches. We do, we do a retro. I have a team of coaches I work with with this one job, and they started putting little icons all over the 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 sailboat. That sailboat had more icons on it. Little pirates and happy. It was it was funny. It just went off into a whole different direction, but they enjoyed it, right? And they got something out of it, too, at the same time, so that was cool. Greg, sorry, could you just um, explain the four icons you use for the quadrants again? Oh. Does this help? Yeah. Um, so is the sailboat, like, supposed to be in the middle? or the sailboat Yeah, the sailboat's in the middle. They call it the sailboat. The sailboat, you just draw your your vertical and your horizontal, and then it mm -hmm. just looks like a sailboat. Sometimes I draw it like this. Sometimes I make a little sail in the front. Just to make it different. So this is what the top left is what's good that happened during a sprint. The bottom left is what was bad. And then I have what can we do to improve our process and then risks. Okay. Sometimes the risks are like, hey, we know someone's upgrading Oracle you know, next month. <laughs> How is our system going to handle the upgrade? <laughs> that might be a risk that they go, oh, we should really come up with some uh, automated tests to check what we want so when we do upgrade to the new version of Oracle, we don't crash the system. You know, so that might be, that'd be a risk. Thank you. Okay. So, so we got 11.50, so let's keep going. We're running on question three. All right, question four. Now, this is kind of gets squishy. So we'll just kind of talk to this. Um, you get meeting invites. So we're in a vir virtual environment, right? Uh, getting these Outlook meeting invites, and there's no agenda, and you have a conflict. Here's the three, and anybody can answer. Do you go to the meeting? Do you ignore it? Do you go to the other meeting um, or some other answer? Uh, and any, what would, if you got a meeting invite and you, and it had no agenda, what would you do with it? Anybody want to chime in on that? Ignore it. Ignore it. Okay. Anybody else? I might ask for an agenda. Okay. Ask for agenda. Okay. Yeah. That's what I would do. I'll just chat the person up on Slack or whatever channel we use. Hey, what's up? I got this invite. What am I? What, what's going on? Just ask for it. Or you just communicate. Okay. Okay. How about this? And I, and I'm kind of giving you a hint to it. So I'm just gonna go because we're we're going tight on time for you all. I mean, I could talk all day, but we we can we can do this at some point. Is this a coaching opportunity? Right. So me as an agile coach, I teach my agile coaches this. I go. There's no agenda. Is this an opportunity to say, I'm not going to go, I ignore it, or for you to engage with the person like you just said about engaging on Slack or whatever's there and say, hey, look, hey, there's no agenda. Um, you know, some of the things, if we don't have agenda, so people have uh, conflicting meetings, they may choose the other meeting because they know what it is where your meeting doesn't, they don't have an agenda. So they may choose the other one to attend and not really go to your meeting. And you help coach and help them learn about why agendas help with stuff and also helps with your daily scrum. And daily scrum, I have all I have all my scrum masters put an agenda. Like we go through each group, here's our um, team norms, how we operate. You know, if you're not a member of the team, please be quiet, send your questions to Scrum Master because they might want to invite other people. But I usually I may even make them put that agenda in there. Um, so think of this as a coaching opportunity. So the answer may not be like if you wanted to be an agile coach or coach somebody and you said you want to ignore it. I go, ha, how about coaching them on how to do a good job on their meeting invites? Because facilitation of the meeting is the key role of a scrum master, right? Or helping other people learn how to facilitate. So that's start day one. And this is also helpful for any business analyst because they do a lot of meeting planning too. All right, number five, core agreements. 
Um, in my opinion, there are three core agreements in Scrum and any meeting operations in general. Um, and let's say you come into a team. And I'm going to say, okay, I got a team for you. Um, it's missing either the team norms, definition ready, or definition done agreement. All right. How would you go about putting one of those agreements together? Now, this would be the question. You get a, Then you would go in and here's what I would do. Is anyone want to volunteer real quickly how they might go about getting one of these agreements together? Like in a minute? Anybody do this? See, now this is a question on your interview. Someone needs to be able to say how they actually put it together a team agreement. No? Quiet? Um, okay. So for the uh, team norm agreement, so when we're just setting up a new team, yeah, uh, it's important to let everybody know that um, starting out, it's good to have um, a team agreement so that we know and respect each other's time and commitments. Okay. And uh, encourage everyone to contribute to it because when how? everybody contributes to it, there's ownership. Now I'm going to lead you to a question. How would you go about organizing that event? Uh, so for, depends on the team. If, uh, I, I, it would be good to, since I'm facilitating, I don't want to be the one doing the job, but if, um, I well, you got to do something, good. even in facilitating, you got to set it up. So you oh, got to yeah. do the setup. So okay. I'm talking about the setup. You're facilitating, oh. you're about to facilitate this meeting. What would you do? Yeah. So I'll set up, we'll have a meeting and then uh -huh. at the meeting, if, for example, we could use Mi Miro or Mural and, um, okay. encourage, if, um, encourage everyone to put down their thoughts and um, so that everybody puts what they feel the team should do. Okay. Uh, have too many things on it. We could then vote up things so that the most important ones are there and we all are in agreement that these are the things we're going we're gonna to follow as we work together as a cohesive team for the most efficiency. And, and that's awesome. And then I, I might add a question. Who would you invite to that meeting? Oh, um, so um, as a Scrum Master, definitely, I'm, so if I'm working with a new team, I want to make sure all the um, developers are, are um, you know, present because okay. we're working together um, on a daily basis. And also the product owner, too, could be okay. a part of that. Perfect. So yep. just the three stakeholders, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Some people think, why does the product owner need to be? Because you're making, they're going to be in your meetings. You want them to have an agreement and how they interact with you a lot. So it's important. Yeah. Um, and just, and that was perfect. I mean, I can't add anything better than what you just said. So that's cool. And the one thing I would add is your definition ready, your, your, all these agreements, you may want to look at them every quarter to see if they still apply. Cause I'll, couple things one i would think your definition of done will mature and get better and it should change every quarter if your definition of done is not changing every quarter then you're not improving your business you're not improving your team that's my challenge for you right so i might throw a question how often should you change the definition of done and why right so that's a that's the kicker question on that one all right so bonus question number one since we're down to the end, are we? Is it okay if we go a little bit over the hour, or we, we need to make sure we end it? We're good. Okay, we're good. All right. Um, bonus question on Scrum events. Classic question. Got this in person and remote. What is your favorite sprint event or Scrum event? Right. My favorite. I'm going to give you this. That's a question that I might come back and say. You know, my favorite is sprint review. Why do you think my my favorite event is the sprint review? Can anybody tell me why they think my 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 favorite is the sprint review? Possibly because the stakeholders are actually present. That's good. Anybody else? Because the team gets to kind of present on what they worked on, and so I guess like it, it allows the team to build. The, you, you get to see them building their confidence um, in the sprint review. Yeah. And so basically kind of being like a, you know, um, you dare to see them win kind of thing. Yeah, I like that. Yes. Yeah. Go and, ahead, uh, 
this this is where you get to basically showcase the value, the increment that yes that has been so ready for. Yes. But I wanted to mention that I once got um, um, a question, but it was a flip side of this. And the question was, what is the most important Scrum event? You know, um, what the Scrum guy tells us, they are all important. So yes. none should you know, be taken out. So that was like a trick question. Mm -hmm. um, um, but they said, oh, you have to, you know, pick one. You know, and so I, I did say oh, the sprint planning because sprint planning has to be, you know, on point mm -hmm. in order for succeed towards your sprint goal. Okay. You know? Awesome. But I don't know. Yeah. And for me, why I like sprint review and it's a little bit of everything everyone said, it's a chance for the team to shine, to show off their wares and get that feedback from the customer right away on how they did and, and it's, it's like to be proud of themselves and to show value to the customer I'll give you a warning i've had teams that haven't presented they one person said to me one day the other day oh you're the first group to see our product i'm like what oh my god because it was a whole organization i said you what? You should be out there giving it to it every two weeks and let people oh no right and they wonder why and I shouldn't say this, but the customer is not too happy because the customer doesn't see the product, right? So just warning on that. Make sure they're doing sprint reviews so many times. That's one of the – every action event, they, we don't need to do that. But that's one of the events that, like, we don't need the demo. We have nothing to demo. Huh. Is that a good thing, right? So just think about that. All right, let's do the last one. Excuse me, Greg. Can yeah. we talk about this? Uh, can we talk about the issue of uh, having something to demo? Uh, because you know, sometimes when we get work, uh, you get to probably just work at the technical side of it, and you don't really have anything to demo in the real sense of it for the business. Uh, in that kind of situation, you could go three iterations without really having anything to demo. Is this still a bad sign? Like the yes. team is not doing well. Yes. Um, there's always something you can demo from a business standpoint. Even if it's not at the production level, you should always be able to demo something. But you can also do technical demos too. When I worked at a big company called Comcast um, here in the States for a while, they would do technical demos. And it was amazing. All the technical geeky people, men and women, would be in there. And they would just launch off an app. And all of a sudden, you would see like 30 million. Boom, it would just go across the screen. And they were all like, I want that. <laughs> and then the technical people would grab it for themselves. So you can do a technical demo, but you should always have something for the customer. If the customer is giving you what they want, you want to show them every sprint what you're doing. Something. Thank you. Even a small uh, if, little if, thing. Even if it's yeah, just testing. Even if, even if it's just the slightest functionality. Yes. Yeah, even if you're just testing something for them to yeah, see. Yeah, just, yes. You want yeah. that functionality. Because they know they're getting their money's worth because they they can't handle a month. Trust me. They may think they can, but they that's why no one likes IT. <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, I got to go there. Um, they can't handle that. Uh, so, okay. Uh, now let's talk about workflow. So you're remote. How, if you're not walking around, right, you're not walking around the, the room, how do you know what people are doing, right? This might be a board you see coming out of the box here. They have a to-do column, a doing column, and done. And they have all this stuff in doing, right? And one done and a couple in to-do. Anybody want to chime off what this is telling them? Or might be observant if I were to throw that up on a board. What does this tell you? Anybody curious? There are too many things, there are too many things just incomplete and in the play, you know. So, okay. Uh, Probably they were picking, maybe the, a developer is picking like two different tickets um, and not just getting anyone specifically done. So this is like a story where Kanban could come into place where you can agree on um, mm -hmm. working limits. Yeah. Yeah. This is like a little Kanban board right here. That's what that scrum board is. It's actually a Kanban board, just not as complicated. Anybody else? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Umoke. Hey, man. Um, uh, hello. I, I think for me, it's more to do with uh, managing, pulling in work, 
um, to from to do to doing, um, making sure you're churning our business value per time. Uh, don't take more than you can manage at any one uh, at any point in time. That way, okay. you're not having uh, you know the doing column just plugged up waiting yeah. uh, for for reviews and because that can actually spike you know your metrics. If for instance you're using um, Jira, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, that will that will definitely spike and and you know questions will be asked at the end of the day why that's the case. Yeah, well that's perfect. All right. Yeah, I agree with uh, what Himano said um, right. totally. Sometimes as well, it can also connote um, you needing approvals for different you know aspects of what you're working on, you know, mm-hmm. and that it can actually show maybe some form of. Um, Maybe disorganized um, um, or, or, or part of the law quarrels between stakeholders. Sometimes mm-hmm. you have so much stuff, you know, you need to approve to done. You know, it yep. can come that way as well. Yep. No, perfect. So I want to give you a couple little scenarios. So if I was going to, how can you use workflow to figure out where your team is? It's kind of hard to figure it out. Everything's in process, right? Um, this is where that little whiteboard might come in handy if you had to do something really quick because you can draw that up. I'm going to click on see if this works. There we go. So what I did is take that same board you see here and I built workflow columns for the stories. So there's still the same three to do, but now there's two in dev, two in peer review, two in test, and one is done. So now it gives you a better idea how you really are. So what you saw on this was really this. So maybe you don't have a problem. You just thought you did because you got two in tests or working on it. Maybe there's a couple needing peer review from other coworkers and then two are deaf. So maybe it's not so bad. But by doing this, you can see the work flowing. It's actually flowing. It's actually moving. Because if you went through the whole sprint, again, if you were to do it in Jira or Azure and you had those three columns like we have here, right? These probably won't move. That's a that's a burn down chart that stays up until the end, right? This is that burn down chart. So it could be in process, but it it doesn't tell you anything. But by manipulating your your columns to your workflow, and don't go too crazy. Keep it to a reasonable amount of stuff steps that they normally do because usually you have a peer review. It's a good thing to do. There's testing, which is different from dev, right? Maybe someone else has to, I, I like to have other people test other people's code. Even if they're all developers, I don't like having the same person test and develop it because then they can cheat, right? So at least if someone else is testing it, it wasn't you. <laughs> oh, it worked great. Wait a minute, right? So there's one thing, and then here's another one. I also like to do it in two ways. I actually create multiple views in Jira for the same database, for the same issues. I also do a storyboard with subtasks. So here you can do it by here, but then you can also do it with subtasks where now I have a story and these are subtasks where I have peer review, like, okay, done, the design of the, the work is done. Maybe my testers are writing some test case. My developers are coding. What we have left to do for a particular story is we have to do a peer review and a test. So this is another way of looking at it where you can do swim lanes by story and do subtasks. So there's a lot of different ways you can do it. And you can present this at your interview with your little whiteboard or something on different ways you can take what this is on this side and change your board. So everyone has a good visibility of what's going on. Okay. So I just wanted to share that to you. These are, these are advanced questions, but this is where... You can work with the team and come up with a good flow. And it's not about the scrum master coming up with the flow. It's about working with the team and figure out what they would like to use from a flow perspective. I love these flows because they don't have to really update the stories or anything. They just move the tasks over to the next column and that's their only update they have to do. So that way, if anybody says they didn't update Jira and didn't put it into the definition, I'm like, how long does it take you to move the, the thing from there, the subtask, like you were going to code it? It takes you a second. It's not that long. I'm not looking for a lot of information, right? Plus, if I see this, I know exactly what it is and where we're at. So, any questions on these? 
Okay. And I guess that's it. That's all the questions. And we only had five questions. If you want, I have, I don't know how many, I have like 700 and some odd shows on the 5 a.m. Master Scrum Show, all kinds of different things, little tidbits. They're 15 minute long. You can uh, always look for different things. I'm trying to um, categorize them in different topics for people in the future. So that's coming. Any questions? Any, any open-ended questions you have for me? Anybody got a tricky interview question they couldn't think of? I saw. Oh. Uh, and everyone, please, we could uh, we could drop our questions on the chat, and uh, if we have a question, maybe uh, outside, uh, maybe what Greg has talked about or something you thought, okay, we're talking about, you could also maybe want to want to share that as well. Uh, yeah, uh, Greg, I just thought of uh, why you were uh, talking about uh, the, the the sprint retrospective, mm -hmm. and you 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 brought in that uh, like that's a double diamond. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, double diamond of actually trying to uh, pursue a solution. Mm -hmm. The divergent, the divergent thing, yep. and later we we, con we converge. Yep. Yeah, we. Yeah, in, in us in a case also we also have. Uh, uh, this uh, double diamond uh, sprint. So I wouldn't know. Uh, what do you mean you have a double diamond sprint? Yeah, that that's uh, I think someone someone got uh, asked that kind of question in an interview case. He mm -hmm. said, uh, "How would you organize? How would you organize a double diamond sprint?" So uh, I don't know if uh, that's something you are aware of. I mean, want to throw light on, or if it was someone else. Would maybe also want to. Uh, I have never heard it. of a double diamond sprint. Now you got to make <laughs> someone Google it because <laughs> I don't know. I've never heard of that term. Yeah, that would, someone was actually asked that uh, question in an interview that how will he organize a double diamond sprint? So, uh, my only worry would be if someone asked me that question, I'm like, are you like, is it two? It would be, is, is it scaring me? Cause it's like, is it like two different sprints, like a, a design sprint and then an actual working sprint maybe where you're looking at all the problem solving in the beginning of the sprint. And then towards the end, you're trying to solve the problem as a group. I mean, that could be a double diamond, right? Where everyone in the group works together, talk about the different problems we want to solve and then they, they converge, here's what we think we're going to do, and they diverge off to people solving those problems, and they converge again, showing what, what they came up with. That would be the closest I can think of, and now I have to Google it. Anybody Google it? Anything? Double Diamond Sprint? No? He's talking about a model. He's talking about a model, a technological model, a way to approach work, more like a framework. That's what I can say briefly. Okay. I'm talking about the double diamond as a framework, maybe comparing it with Scrum or with the Kanban. I don't know. I'm still reading though. Okay. <laughs> but, I have to go look but, at that one. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Go on. Go on with the question. Thank you, Max Akesi from from Austin, Texas. Hey, yeah. Max. Uh, Greg, thank you for sharing all of this. Had a question in regards to the slide where you had the Kanban slide and then you broke up the work in progress stuff into the various columns of dev, review, test. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I've been leading agile transformations for about 12 years plus. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest challenges I see is in Scrum with teams is, oh, the sprint is two weeks long. We have mm -hmm. two weeks to get the work done. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you have all this work in progress stuff mm -hmm. for the whole sprint. And then stuff gets done in the last two days. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got it done and everything. And what I'm trying to get to people now is speed is so essential because the faster you get the work done, the faster you can get feedback on that work. The faster okay. you can integrate that feedback into your mm -hmm. work. So then when I look at so much in the doing column mm -hmm. and not as much in the done, 
I I suppose you you understand where I'm trying to yep. get to that there's just too much work in progress. You need to get stuff done because until you don't get that feedback, whether we yep. deploy it to production or who knows what uh, demo in the a dev environment, you truly don't know the value of the work. Yes, no, I totally agree with What's you. What's your feedback? Because it's not I'll, exactly I'll, aligned with what I see here. I'll give you two things. I'll give you two it, things it, on it that. It depends on uh, how long they're doing columns. Because at the start of the sprint, definitely there will be a lot of um, tickets in the doing. So it's, yeah. not, it's not going to evenly spread across uh, from to do, doing, and done. Or do right. they stay there and decay there? So that works to really matter because at some point you must have a lot of doing when everybody picks their, 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 their time. Not necessarily. Okay, I'll, now I'm going to do three things. Now I'm going to do two. Now I'm going to do three. So two, two things. One on the design of your team. So this is one of the things Scrum Masters do and how do you facilitate team, teams, right? So if, if you have a lot of stuff in doing, one, you shouldn't have anything more than doing than the number of people on your team. Okay, there's a little cap there. And if you have more than the number of people, then you have too much stuff in doing. You ask the question, is is for every story, is there going to be multiple people working on that story, right? So therefore, you can have one story, but you have two or three people working on that story. Maybe there's a tester, a developer, who knows what else, right? A UX yeah. person, all working together on the story at the same time. So really, you should you would only have one story in process, but a bunch of people working on it. So that's where you get that's where you get this bottom kind of thing going on here, where you can have more than one people, but it still shouldn't be a lot. So that was one. The other one, go back to the 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 norms, the team norm. I like teams to come up with a team norm on how do you pick stuff and add it to the doing pile. Right. Maybe. The, and, 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 and I just want to say what the third one, I just want to say real quick, a waiting column. I hate the waiting column. If I see a waiting column, me as a scrum master, my brain blows up. Right. Waiting. What do you mean we're waiting? Why are we waiting? Why is this? Then that's my job as a scrum master. Get that sucker off the waiting column and, and do a retro of why it's in the waiting. So that's it. But Great. now. Yes. Is the waiting column the same as blocked? Like in my organization, they, there's a column called blocked. Like, you can, you, um, I'm going to tell you right now, you can use a column called block, but every software system I know, you can right click on the tag, the issue, and change it to a flag or impediment and change the color. You really don't need a column for blocked. You shouldn't need that. Because I like the visual. If it's yellow, everyone's like, "Whoa, why is that yellow?" <laughs> it just, it just grabs, you know, pulls everybody in there. Or maybe make it turn red. I don't know, purple, whatever color you like. Um, but you can do that without doing the workflow stuff. Because I don't think blocked is considered a workflow. I just think wherever it's doing, who's working on it, it's, and then that person should be talking about it every day as what's locking them. And then we swore. So, so just go ahead. I just want to ask something about this block issue. Yeah. Um, take for, okay, I had this issue. We already have the work plan for this iteration. Mm -hmm. And then when we started, the other team that we had, this other team that we're supposed to, we had dependency with. And uh, while the work was ongoing, we couldn't move on with that story because that team had issue. <laughs> uh, so now you yeah. got into the definition already. See, what you just <laughs> said just brought up the definition already. So, we, okay, you don't have a good definition already, by the way. I, I guess so. I guess so. They just ran into this issue in between the, the sprint was running and then we had to move this story to block. Okay. We completed the sprint and then we had to wait one more sprint before we could complete that particular story. Ah. So, was, so this yeah. is a retro item. So now, see how this goes? <laughs> you could be the busiest Scrum Master on the planet when you get this. Now you're retroing on, why did it go in the block column? Why was maybe we don't have a definition ready? Maybe we need to work on definition ready. Maybe we didn't communicate to the other team before that we needed them to work, and we just assumed we would just jump in on top and add some issues on top their sprint backlog while they're in the middle of the sprint. 
And we didn't do the due diligence to let them know ahead of time and have that communication. Whose job was that to communicate with the other team to have that work done before you do your team? So, so, so you could do a fishbone and then you can go all these different answers. And this is that divergent. What are all the different problems that could be contributing? To, and then what are the different solutions? Maybe it is a definition already. Maybe it's um, something else. Maybe it's because we didn't talk to them. You know, <laughs> who knows, right? Uh, it could be a lot. So on my last one, I'm going to go back to these these documents. That's why those three documents are so key. Definition done, definition ready, and team norms. Team norms. I have teams, when you talk about this doing part, what are our rules for pulling stuff off the backlog? Even the done part. So it works for all of it. Okay, I'm going to go pick a new item off the list. If it's not in that order, let's say I did all the things I was going to do. What am I? What's my hierarchy for picking stuff up? I like to do it this way. It's four things, kind of. It's like four or five. Um, one, is there anything I can um, fix the coding on it? What do you want to call it? I, my brain just went blank. But when you want to refactor the code, is there anything I just did I can refactor before I go grabbing something off the future backlog? Let's say from another sprint or the big backlog. So can I refactor it? Two, should I ask any of my teammates, do they need help with their stories? Do we need into this story mode? Anybody need help? And do that before I go grab another thing. Three, um, ask the team, should I go take something else? If they're okay with it, can I get it done in the sprint? And if I think I can, go to the product owner and say, hey, product owner, is there something you would like us to bring? I think I have some time, a couple of days left in the sprint. We can bring something in. I can get it done in the sprint. What would you like to do? So we actually write that in our team norms. So everyone, because you always got that one person. Oh, I'm just going to randomly go pick stuff off the backlog and bring it into the sprint because I did my stuff. So we actually had to create those team norms of that process, thought process. And I just drilled it in their heads as an agile coach and scrum master. And then they got to the point where they're in their daily scrum. Okay, what would Greg say? <laughs> and they put my Greg hat. They actually made a hat that said the Greg hat on it. What would Greg ask us? And it's like, oh, yeah, we go our team norms. Yep. Do we follow our team norms? Yep, yep, yep. And then they would, and that's how they would do that. So when you see that doing thing, you can do the same thing with the team norms. What is that? Your 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 Kanban chart might include team norms. Like how many test things do we have at a time? You know, even in testing, and I didn't put this in, sometimes organizations have developers and testers, right? They do. They just do. <laughs> it's just the way of life. I put a column called waiting for test. And why I do that, I want the developer to say, hey, I have this work available for you to test. But I want to know exactly what my testers are testing. Because if you combine the two, it gets really long. But how many? I'm like, dude, you got 10 things in your testing column. You can't. It's just one of you. How are you testing 10? Oh, I'm only testing one. Okay. So I created another column in the workflow called waiting for test. And now that helps my people know from a development standpoint, do they need to swarm and help the testers? Do my business analysts need to go help the testers? Who else in my group can go help the testers get some more testing done? So there you go. Does that help you, Max, with like how do you do that and, and use that workflow maybe to – too. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree 100% with the workflow to be able to visualize the work. I just get sometimes concerned when there's a lot in the doing and not as much done. But of course, you've got to go into the details a bit more to yeah, understand. Yeah, the all details. you see on the got screen, it, it. it just mm -hmm. triggers you where you want to ask the questions. To. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And, and, and even, yeah, and the other thing could be maybe the stories are too big. Exactly. Right. And again, all the things we mentioned about waiting for somebody, that's why they the doing gets bigger and everything like that. You know, it, and then you, then you start, that's the first thing you do as a, as a scrum master. Okay, why why are we, why are we here? <laughs> yeah, the five whys. You go through the five whys. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So but thank you, Greg. Uh, Greg, to add to what you were saying, um, <clears throat> the concept of uh, swarming, so everyone's working on like the same story. One of the ways that I have gotten around the uh, let's use up all of our time during this sprint and scramble at the end kind of, it was um, sort of instilling that 
mode of operation or getting agreement that will work in terms of sprint priority. So mm -hmm. wherever we can, we're looking at, um, we want to complete one story at a time together as a team. It also helps with like cross um, uh, training and, you know, having everybody jump in where they can. I think it, mm -hmm. it does also facilitate the, the whole teamwork concept. Yep. So if we work in terms of the sprint priorities, um, one at a time, wherever possible, and get that agreement up front. I think then the team also gets to see, you know, mid sprint or yep. early on, we can do internal reviews and they get excited about the work done. Mm -hmm. But it does take a lot of, um, it, it takes some time to get people on board with that concept. Yeah. It, it, and that's where you get a more mature team, right? And they turn out more stuff because maybe they're just doing, okay, let's just do work on like, two stories at a time and then they just team up on the two um whatever you know how, yeah i agree with yeah. you i agree with you totally that's another another way of looking at it too and also and there is a question from florence florence has her hand up yeah i have my hand up i just wanted you to uh, elaborate on like uh, using velocity to improve team's performance that's a question that also comes out <sighs> in interviews it all right, so I'm going to get my little whiteboard out. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, and it has to go on this side because um, I can't write the other way. I haven't taught myself how to do that yet. One day I'll do that for my show. Um, so, when you're using the velocity over time, I like to use that. There's a chart in Jira called Velocity History or Velocity Chart. So, you got your, your points and you got your sprints. Right. And 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 what I look at, I look at. I look at two things. I look at what the team commits to and what they get done. OK. And when I first get teams, they over, always overcommit and what they get done is less. And then maybe the next sprint, they 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 commit to lower. And then have you ever seen this hourglass? And then they get and then it goes like this. So. What I look at is how how big of a gap, and when I so this is the first when the first team start, and then I want to see the velocity stone going up. What I will warn you, if you associate story points with hours, your velocity will always do that. Mm. Okay, once you associate points to hours, you only have forty hours in a week. This is the maximum number of story points. You can't do better. There's no way you can do more than the time allotted in the time box. So that's why when people do the points, let's say, well, you destroy the whole velocity metric, the, the whole process, and everyone uses it. So why are you smarter than the entire universe, right? And they look at me like, what do you mean? It's like, it's capped out. You can never improve your velocity. It'll look like this. It'll look like and I drew a shark teeth, and then I draw a little shark. And then I make a little fishy, right? And he's got a little thing. It looks like the little shark teeth because that's how many days are in the week, right? If you see that, that's I can I can look at someone's velocity history. I said you're doing it by hours, aren't you? And they're like, how do you know that? I said I could look at your chart. Um, where I look for it, I look for the gap between the committed, and I wish I had a different color. Let's say that's committed, and this is what they did, and maybe they're up here committed. And they did up here. Maybe they commit up here because someone, some VP came by and they did a, maybe this. And maybe one sprint they did way up there, but they committed down here. So there's this gap, right? I measure that gap, right? I look at that gap. I want to see that what they commit to and what they get done are, are pretty tight so that we, that our customer um, trust our estimates, trust our prediction that we're going to get done in our time box. So that's what I do when I look at velocity. I look at that difference and then I look at is the velocity getting better? But I also will challenge people when they say it's getting better. I said, well, did you just hire two people? And they're like, yeah. Well, then that doesn't count. <laughs> right? Um, what I would challenge you in your retros if you here's here's how I catch people off guard. They say, well, yeah, our velocity went up. We did more points. Well, how did you do it? Well, we just did. I said, did you do a retro? 
Well, no. Did you, did you do an action in your retro to improve your process for the team? Well, no. Well, then whatever you're showing me is means you're playing with games, right? You're trying to con me on your hmm. velocity. See how that is? If you're not doing a little retro process to improve your process, there's no reason on the planet Earth why your velocity should be getting better. Except for maybe they get better at the code. They can learn more, but there's only so much, right? But there should be little process improvements like, oh, I want to take a, a class on Java, or we took a class on Java so we could write better JavaScript, right? Hello, hello, Greg. Yes. Hello, Greg. Hey. Yeah. Well done. You've done a good, you know, job this evening, and uh, we are glad to have you. You know, because of time, we are say, running right? up. In, in, we are running yeah. up in a mini yes, yes time. So I would like you to just give us a a recap, a final word. You know, um, why exactly? Yeah. Okay. Um, whatever. If you have more questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always taking on some people that wouldn't be coached and stuff like that. Um, I did offer stuff for veterans here in the States, if you know any veterans, that they get some free coaching. Um, I got spaces for like five coaches. If anybody wants um, and has any questions or are interested in some coaching things, let me know.